Now Galen was followed by Euclid. Um, actually, I'm sorry, he wasn't. Galen was preceded by Euclid, uh, who was alive in 300 BC. And he is important because he was interested in mathematics, specifically in geometry. And his book, Elements, is considered the most influential textbook perhaps ever written. And that's why he is now known as the father of geometry. And he's responsible for introducing concepts like definition and axiom, theorem and proof. So really fundamental things that you might remember from your school days when you were sitting around and deriving uh, properties of things and, and measuring different uh, geometric shapes and trying to relate all of these things in a mathematical way. So the Roman Empire, as you may recall, getting a bit of a history lesson here uh, in general, was divided in the third century. And it was divided into the West, which is basically Europe and us, and then it was divided into the East. And that's where you had people um, like the Arabs who continued to do quite a lot of research and they were mixing with the Indians and with the Chinese. And, and there was quite a lot of exploration of ideas going on there in the East. But in the West, we were relatively cut off from all of that. So everything that happened from the third century and before we had access to and maybe had copies of some of these sources. Uh, but everything after that, it was much harder for us to get hold of. And so that was why you saw a lot of stagnation of science in the Middle Ages. And so all these advances that Muslim scholars in particular were making during what's called the Islamic Golden Age, uh, where they were doing lots of experiments and they were really coming up with some amazing things, we didn't have access to that. And instead, our knowledge was really concentrated in monasteries. And this was true up until about the 12th or 13th centuries. And at this point, um, the, the clerics started to establish medieval universities, and that allowed some outsiders to come in. And so it wasn't just religious people who had knowledge and access to knowledge, but it, little by little it was other people as well. And it was also around this point that we again made contact with the Islamic world in Spain and in Sicily, and then again, uh, under potentially less nice circumstances during the Crusades. And all these encounters allowed Westerners to start to see all these things that Aristotle and Ptolemy and, and other researchers had started to come up with. And so again, we were beginning to come up to speed again with what was going on in the world of science. And a lot of these texts that I'm talking about that, that we were able to access, they were written in Arabic. And so in the West, there was formed something called the Toledo School of Translators, and that allowed researchers to go in and learn how to translate from Arabic into the Latin that they were familiar with, or they could go in and have someone else do it for them. And so that meant that they did have access to the, the very first text themselves. And people thought that, you know, even though you could have someone translate it for you, actually the best thing to do was to learn Arabic yourself so you could actually be reading the original. And there was a lot of pride to be taken in reading the original and working from that. And because of all of these changes, you see schools beginning to alter their infrastructure in order to develop curricula and allow access to texts and share information among the, uh, these different institutions and different researchers. And actually, at that point, it's really interesting. The study of science and the study of nature was pretty much at the center of any academic career, which is quite different from what we see today. So at that time, anyone who went into an institution would kind of have this basic liberal arts type of education where they studied a little bit of everything to be a well-rounded student. And because everything happened within the natural world, then it was thought that you should understand that natural world in order to develop a better understanding of all of these other fields as well. And a lot of this process, um, obviously, as I've mentioned, the Crusades and this contact with the, the Muslim people, um, a lot of this had to do with voyages to other countries, and these really expanded our horizons. So not just were we venturing into the, the Middle East and contacting people who live there, but we were also sending explorers like Marco Polo, uh, who could have contact with the Chinese and, and also with the Indians, and bring back some of their ideas as well. And in honor of that idea, the, the importance of, of voyages and making contact with other people, I am playing Charlotte Gainsbourg, singing Voyage. And that was Charlotte Gainsbourg singing Voyage, or as I suppose she would say it, Voyage. And we are playing that song in honor of all of the voyages that allowed Western civilizations to, be, to come into contact again with uh, the East after a big period of, of 
break and of the dark ages really and this allowed us to establish contact with scientists and get access to a lot of scientific materials and begin to expand our ideas again. And before I go on and discuss this topic in a bit more detail, I just want to share with you that something momentous has happened over the break. I have received my very first text message while on air. And this text message says, I like your show, so I have my very first fan as of today. And if you are someone else who's listening and you like the show, do feel free to write in and let me know. And in fact, if you are listening and you don't like the show, it would be nice to hear from you so I can find out what it is that you would like me to do different. Um, or if there is something that you think I should be doing more or less of. And actually, always, I'm interested in hearing what sorts of topics you would like me to talk about, because right now I just kind of choose things at random as I become interested in them. And I'd be happy to choose things specifically to answer questions that you guys have about different aspects of science. All right, so back to the topic at hand. Um, right, so this brings us up to uh, the 13th century, when Western scholars were not only coming back into contact with these Eastern texts, but learning from them and then beginning to make improvements on these ideas and make their own advances as well. So for instance, we have people like Roger Bacon, who, uh, like Aristotle and Plato, was then advocating an empirical approach to things and, and trying to bring us out of this era of just observing things from afar and making conclusions. But he wanted to actually go out and do some experiments to try to find out what was really going on in, in the world. Now, unfortunately, all of this, this promise that was being shown by the 12th and 13th centuries was brought to a huge halt by the Black Death or the plague in 1348. So we had this kind of flourishing period, and it showed, like, uh, showed all this promise that we were going to keep taking forward and keep developing new ideas, and then boom, we had the plague, and it killed off lots of people. And then we had the fall of Constantinople, which was also a huge historical event followed again, uh, well actually just immediately preceded by uh, the introduction of printing and the development of the printing press around 1440. And all of these things, uh, first they kind of stopped the progress and then they kind of started it up again because here we have the democratization of ideas and of learning and spreading of ideas uh, between lots of different people and between lots of different countries. And suddenly we have this more open uh, political system and, and lots of different countries that are suddenly in contact with each other now that we have not just this one huge um, block of land ruled out of Constantinople, but lots of different peoples and lots of different rulers emerging. And so this is what kind of helped usher us into the scientific revolution. And researchers will tell you that the official beginning of this period was 1543. And that is when Andreas Vesalius published what's known in English as On the Workings of the Human Body, or in the original Latin, De Humani Corporis Fabrica. And again, I'm so sorry for my pronunciation of things. Um, this is also the time when Nicholas Copernicus printed, uh, I'm not even going to try to say this in, in English, but basically he's a, he printed a book that talked about how the Earth revolves around the Sun. And these were huge ideas at the time, and they had huge insights into medicine and anatomy and astronomy and kind of just our fundamental place in the world and how we worked. And perhaps the pinnacle of this era was when Sir Isaac Newton published uh, his book on mathematics in 1687. And during all of this period, and thanks to people like this and others, we have this shift from Aristotle's idea of natural philosophy to actively studying specialist fields. So here we'd had Aristotle who was kind of interested in everything and fitting it all together, to people starting to do what we now have today, uh, to some extent, where you've got a special um, focus in chemistry maybe, or botany, or anatomy, or medicine. So rather than being kind of a polymath, you focus on one particular thing and go into quite a lot of depth in that field.